So we talked about object-oriented programming, which is this idea of trying to approach programming by breaking down an application into these separate objects that are collections of data and actions um, associated with one another. So you might have a player who has a name, that might be some data that's associated with the player, it might have an age, um, and then it might have actions, like it can walk and run and swim um, in a game world. So I wanna talk about UML, which is Unified Modeling Language, which is a standardized way for us to represent object-oriented programming in um, written form. So instead of having to go through the process of coding, we can actually do some of the thinking of building our application, which is actually where a lot of the real work happens in programming, is in the thinking and problem solving. So we can do that without actually having to write the code. And so for framing this, let, let's think about Tamagotchi. Let's think about virtual pets like Pokemon. Um, if we're building a game world like that, what are the objects we might need? And then we will dive into UML and actually um, making some UML for virtual pets. So I'm gonna pull up a whiteboard. And the first thing you might do when you're thinking about an application is start mapping out what are the objects. So if we're talking about Pokemon, we might have a virtual pet as an object. And we might have a player in that world that is collecting and taking care of virtual pets. And maybe we have things like a toy that you can give to a virtual pet and your virtual pet can hold on to it. And maybe you have food that you can feed your virtual pet. And maybe you have a world which is where all of this stuff lives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you kind of try and break down your application into separate objects. And then what we do for UML, so let me throw UML up at the top here. Uh, we have two different diagram techniques with UML. We have something called a class diagram. and something called an object diagram. They both have a similar structure where they are composed of three boxes. And we'll start with the class diagram. So when we think about one of these entities that we've identified, so like the virtual pet, when we create a class diagram, we are working on the blueprint, so our class. So we would at the top write the name. So this is where name goes. I'm just labeling the boxes. You wouldn't actually put these labels here when you actually write your UML. In the middle box, you would put the attributes. So you can think of these as the variables, as the fields, as the properties that are part of all virtual pets. So you're trying to define the characteristics of virtual pets in your game. So all of them, let's say, have a name. And then we wanna pick a variable type that would make sense to store that name. And uh, in this case, it wouldn't make sense to store it as a number, so we're gonna store it as a string. We might have uh, an age. How old is the virtual pet? Maybe it's age in days, and then we could store it as an int. Um, maybe we have something like hunger level. And maybe it makes sense to store that as a double, like a number that can have a fractional component. And, and we'll store it as a number between 0 and 100. Uh, a lot of these decisions are up to you as to what makes the most sense in terms of how we store this data. But what we're trying to identify here is what are the attributes that are common to all virtual pets on our application. So if we want our virtual pet to have something like a type, like in Pokemon, where Pokemon have different types, we would have to put that into our blueprint here. So that's attributes. Then we have in this section, the operations. So these are the actions that our virtual pet can take in the world. So maybe we want our virtual pet to be able to eat. 
So we would denote it like this, and we'll talk about later what the parentheses mean. But right now we're, we're sort of writing down our operations with these parentheses. So we've got eat, maybe we want our pet to be able to sleep, and maybe we want our pet to be able to play. So our class diagram in UML, Unified Modeling Language, is a definition of that blueprint. So what are the attributes and the operations that all pets in our world should have? So we can put that aside and work on the object diagram, which is, okay, we've got our blueprint. Our object is a specific virtual pet in our world. So maybe we have a pet. Let's um, say we have the pet Leo. And what we would do in filling out our object diagram for our class diagram, from our class diagram, is fill in those variables, fill in those attributes. So the name, instead of just putting string, we're going to say, well, what is this pet's name? So Leo. And the age, how old is this pet? Let's say this pet is like 12 days old. And what is the hunger level of this pet? Let's say it is 0 0.5. The pet's not very hungry. So we've filled in these attributes with specific values for Leo. And then the operations, the way that object-oriented programming works and inheritance works, which we'll unpack later, is that Leo is going to get all of these operations that are defined in the blueprint. So because Leo is a virtual pet, Leo can eat, sleep, and play. So the key here with object diagrams is that each one that we create describes one specific um, instance of our virtual pet, one specific object that exists in our game, in our world, uh, and this one's Leo, but we can also create more. So I'm going to slide over a little bit here. So an object diagram, it can be helpful to, to diagram multiple so that we can catch some of the things that our blueprint might be missing or test out our blueprint. So let's say we've got another one. Let's call it Junior. So we would fill in the name here. Junior. Let's say Junior is a quite old. Junior is 50 days old. And let's say Junior is quite hungry. And Junior has, again, all of these operations. So Junior can eat, sleep, play. And we could keep going. We could create multiple. We could try and diagram all um, the, the sort of possible pets that we think we might want to create in our game world. So UML is a planning technique, which means that it, it is something that you would sit down and do before you start coding, but it is also meant to be a living document. So the first time you think about your game or your application that you're trying to make, you may not actually know what classes and what objects you're going to be creating. You're, you're gonna, this will be our best bet is like, okay, we're making this virtual pet thing. We, we think we want name, age, hunger level. Um, but it might be that in doing this UML or in doing some coding, we would come back and update our UML later when our idea clarifies and we're like, oh, shoot, you know what we wanted? We wanted all our virtual pets to have a species associated with them. So Leo could be um, a cat and Junior could be a parrot. And so then what we would do is we would go in and actually let's do it. So I'm going to erase the I'm going to erase and make some room for this. So we are going to erase this and this. And we would say, OK, we, we've discovered that we need the species stored somewhere. So species string. And maybe we, we discover that we need another operation in here. So we have eat, sleep, 
play. And now we realize that we also want our virtual pets to be able to speak. And once we do that, now that we've updated our class diagram, so our blueprint says that all virtual pets in our world have a species, we need to update our object diagrams. So for the sake of completeness, I'm gonna go ahead and do that here. Let's erase this carefully. Oh, so carefully. Okay, so now that we have updated our class diagram to have species, this needs to be defined here, species. And we would say string is cat, and our species here we said was um, parrot. And same deal, because our operations changed, we need to update our operations box. So forgive the ugly boxes here. Eat, sleep, play, speak. And one of the really helpful things here is the change that I just made by adding species to my virtual pets and by adding speak to the operation of the virtual pets. That was cheap. That was really easy. I'm doing this on pencil and paper. It's a little bit slower because I'm doing it in a screen recording, but on pencil and paper, that, that would have taken me seconds. To make that change in code is more expensive. It would take me more time to go update all of the files that now need to have species and now need to have speak and use species and use speak. So part of the heart of UML is that it's a planning technique and it's cheap. It is just about us thinking about the code, not actually writing the code. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom out here a little bit. Just to summarize, we have this process that we went through where we tried to break down our application into these object-oriented pieces. And then in terms of UML, we have two types of diagrams. We have class diagrams that are meant to represent the blueprint of a particular entity. So the virtual pet, whatever we put in here for attributes and operations, describes all virtual pets in the world. Uh, currently, with our knowledge, there is no way for us to have a virtual pet in the world that has anything different from the attributes that are listed here and the operations that are listed here. If we wanted one of our pets to have another operation, we actually have to make sure that it's in our class diagram. So that's our class diagram. It's about the blueprint. And then our object diagrams, those are different. Those are about specific individuals in our world. So in this case, we, we have two mapped out, but we could have mapped out a whole bunch more. The, the key difference with the object diagram is that your, your fields that you've defined are actually filled in with specific values. Okay, so that's it for UML. I will see you next time.